Okay. And we are live. If anyone's here, we're here. Hello, everybody. Are there people? Uh, we'll find out in a minute. I'm not on the YouTube uh, link oh. at the moment. Um, it will tell me in a second who's watching. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even if they don't comment. Right. Mm. So, Ellen, you're drinking single malt? Yes. S some weird name that I'm not, that I told you I'm not familiar with. But it's good? It's not bad. It's fine. It's Bayside. Um, so it's a different area than um, Ely. Uh, Jack says hello. Hello, Jack. <laughs> yes. Hi, Jack. Which He's Jack? also on the couch right here. <laughs> I know. But my I just, Jack, uh, my you know. Jack's not here. He's sleeping in the kitchen. Who's, who, what Jack is here? <sighs> Jack, her husband. Yes. Oh, wait, your husband? Yes. No, not, not, not Jack the Jerk. Jack the Jerk might show up later. Jack the Jerk. Oh. <laughs> he's my cat. cat. <laughs> oh. Right now he's no, sleeping in the kitchen. Not, no, your your Jack is very cool. We're talking about a, a cat that a big I, black obnoxious. I was afraid cat. you were talking about a blogger. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Yeah, no, I, mean, I was prepared for blog, like you know? okay. he's black very Jack. Iconic. He's Just Jack, yeah, he's like Jack random Jack. keys on the keyboard, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jack. Yes. All right. Four people watching now. People tell them they can comment. Can they hear me? Yes, everyone can hear you. You're live no. now. You can comment anyone to say hello if you like, if you feel like it. And then we can, no one's commenting. So there's an ice cream truck that drives around my neighborhood over and over and over again. I hear about it. And, and I'm in Queens, which is like the hardest hit area in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand it. It's constant. It's like you just hear. Do, 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 do. People go and get their ice cream. Pop goes the weasel. I don't understand. Like people <laughs> yeah, like. Why? Oh, why not? I mean, why you, you know what I really it. want is I really you know want to get the coronavirus from an ice cream truck. You know. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't understand truck. it. How would you get it if the guy breathed on you? Unless he's. I don't know. Him. He's like touching everybody. <laughs> he's driving around the neighborhood. I mean, he is wearing a mask and gloves, but. We haven't ordered in yet. I know a lot of people order food. I order in food all the time. Out. I've been ordering yeah. food all along. I've been doing all of my own cooking. Oh, I just don't. Yeah, that's what we've been doing. <laughs> yeah. Leanna, where are you? Um, I am far out. I don't I don't actually say publicly where I am because Oh, of okay. Some, uh, You're in the ethereal plane. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> yes. No, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I am I am in a nice, quiet, far away, still in the New York City metro area, but uh, so far enough out that it feels like the suburbs. So, yeah, no, I um, order in a lot. I mean, I've been ordering. I'm finding more and more places to order in, and it turns out my local, a local sushi place, now is doing delivery. So I may try them. I tried another one on Sixth Avenue that was it was too far away, and the sushi was not was cold, and you know, and it didn't it didn't quite it didn't taste as Fresh as I would have liked, even though it can really be was cold, so, isn't it? Supposed yeah, I mean, to be cold? It's supposed to. Well, it can be warm, you know. When you, I mean, not you mean hot. Like, you mean like not room temperature? Room temperature, yeah. Okay. Um, but anyway, there's one two blocks from me. I'm I'm going to try them. I mean, my favorite one is down away, and they're not open. But um, well, actually, another one on Twenty Third Street, they're not open, but they're far away too. So I'm going to try the one a couple of blocks from me, which I do yeah. like. You know, I'll see how they're there. I, I ordered pod, I ordered from Thai, Thai food from a place that I go to sometimes on 8th mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I ordered from my our pizza place that I ordered from Matt and I when he comes over to work. That is good there. pizza. It, yeah, it's, they were close it's actually great before. pizza. Did you get your anchovies? No, they don't have anchovies. You didn't, uh, see, you didn't finish watching them on Facebook. I said there were no anchovies that got mushrooms. They didn't oh, okay. No, I didn't, I didn't see but that. It also what didn't taste exactly the way it should either they have a new cook or the cook forgot how to cook for after five months because they were closed for a few months before uh, because of a gas Wait, you mean a cook like i mean it's I not exactly know. i mean no but you know well i'm sure it's i mean i guess there's a recipe uh, you know, and stuff. i mean usually i just see them they open a can of tomato sauce and then no, they no, open food not, and they not, not. no anyway um it was okay it wasn't great but it was really nice to have them back a regular pizza right so, and I had, and it was, you know, I got a small pie, which was huge anyway. It's like, maybe it wasn't a small pie. I tried to get a small pie. It was like, um, 
eight slices or something. I miss pizza. Oh, Carol. No, it had to have been six slices, but really big slices. So I still have two in the freezer. Hello, Sebastian. Thanks for coming. Oh, he's not Hello, coming. Sebastian. Hello, Carol. Wait, you can say so you're on YouTube. You're looking? No, you can no, look at the No, it's coming comments. through. Oh, yeah. I don't see him. coming through on the side. Wait, if you click on the live comment. Public comments. Oh, there they are. Oh, see, I was on the wrong side. No wonder I couldn't see anyone. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, Carol. I don't know the other people. Yeah, no, I was in the wrong section. That's why. Uh, so we started planting some herbs. Mm -hmm. I bought some seeds and, and have them growing in little cups. Oh. Uh, basil yeah. and dill and mint. Although the mint, there was only like three seeds in the thing. <laughs> oh. Okay. Thank you, Carol. This is this is not kind of mint. Um, what kind of mint? Spearmint or peppermint? Uh, peppermint. I like spearmint. Yeah, I like your pictures behind. Thank them. you. Yes, this is this is not like a Zoom background. This is actually, this is actually my awesome. background. So this is actually yeah. So we've got some waterhouse here. We've got my my favorite the a watercolor of the angel of Bethesda, the Bethesda Terrace. I have an adorable owl on a spell book from the Humblewood um, gaming campaign. So and another owl night up there. So there's an Edgar Allan Poe over here in the darkness. So uh -huh. it's all very much on point, on brand. Okay. It is very on brand. I emptied my couch, but not that anyone would see my couch, but I took everything off the couch, the couch part, except the one book and a bunch of tissues and my notes. <laughs> <laughs> it is the season. I've got mine out of frame. Hi. Hi, Carol. Yeah. And I said hello to Carolyn and Teal. Yeah. Yay, Teal! Yeah, so here's my uh, my toad, my toad purse. That was a gift from someone. Half a toad. Mm. <laughs> is it an actual? Oh my god, it's an actual toad. Yes, it is. It's a toad. Oh no! I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> That's my turn. Let me get him back up here. Hi, oh. Amy. Come on, go back. Come on, go back. All right. Yeah. So I did a show and tell. I did a, a walk with the stars from my couch, since I don't have a phone that I can that does video or anything. <laughs> so I had to do it here, and I was I brought um, props. You know, I did a show and tell of things that have meant a lot to me in some of my collections over the years, <clears throat> and that was one of the things I showed off. <laughs> my toad. I don't know if it, if anyone can see, but I have. Um, so I also make jewelry, and I, I rescue Ooh. vintage jewelry pieces, and I try to do new things with them. But so this there's actually an Edgar Allan Poe beneath this smoky quartz. Oh, so nice. I sort of have the the, the shadow of Poe even around my neck. So it's Jack, here's Jack's tail. Excellent. <laughs> He's lying down next to me. Perfect. But uh, I mean, a black cat tail in the frame, also again perfectly there it is. on point. There's a his head. Beauty. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it is, right? <clears throat> Hi, Amy. Who's wearing lipstick? Oh, everyone except me. Everyone. Hi, Amy. Everyone, Matt. I mean, Matt, Matt, you got a great I shade. I always wear lipstick. Matt. Matt. Matt's is more natural. Jack, are you going to bite me? Are you going to bite me? Please don't. Don't be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Julia. Kitty. Hold on, I, this is now. Now I'm now I'm lipstick conscious. Well, yeah, when you say Poe is under your your jewel, what do yep. you mean? You mean it's so an it, it's something? really hard to see, but there is he, there is a Poe oh, underneath. It. It. Okay, very cool. Okay, he's in. He's on there. Right, it's I just see. Just the it. shadow, literally in shadow. That's very nice. Thanks. Oh, I'm wearing a. I'm not sure what it is. Oh, is that a stone? No, it's um, mechanical things or, or computer things in here. I, oh, neat. Something sort of steampunk. Yeah. I don't. Neat. It's clear. It's plastic or glass. What's your medallion, Alana? Um, this is actually just something my grandmother gave me a long time ago. It's beautiful. Uh, okay. People are doing their sounds at seven o'clock. Their tin cans are out there. Oh wow! Yeah. Join in. 
Teal, who does the tin cans? Uh, the, the sounds of neighbors for the, uh, hi, hi, Linda. Oh my God, it's Linda the, Addison. The, for the people who are working the front lines, Teal. You guys, you Linda know, Addison is here. Everything, which I yeah. can't get up my window, so I can't do it. She's been joining us for the last so few I what? miss you so much, Linda. My favorite poet is here, you guys. Oh, wow. I love her so much. Cheers. I hope she can hear me. <laughs> no, that's very Hello. cool. I love her. So we have New York isn't the same without different. you, Linda. Who's wearing black lipstick? Oh, Teal, you're wearing black lipstick? Yeah, I mean, fellow goths, <laughs> right? Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So we should, we'll start at like what, 7.05, 7.10? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. If time, you know, you're just chatting to everyone. Yeah. I miss you, Linda. We need to voice uh, video chat again. Seriously. Oh, so much love. I'm so thrilled. Oh, and this is a little beaker. Oh, you're drinking out of a beaker. Well, that, that's a good scientific yeah. experiment. Yeah. It's a, it technically, isn't that a is that a beaker or is it a graduated cylinder? No, it's a beaker. I have right? no idea. I don't know. Yeah. I ordered it. You know, I mean, it's right. that is set. the most that wonderfully nerdy clarification. Isn't that a beaker? Right. beaker? Oh, hey, I David's here. Got to get a drink. Yay, absolutely. Get a drink. Hi, David. Yes, I've got some single malt here. Oh, so Teal's not wearing? Okay. Black I think he was just being silly. Amy was joking, he says now. Hi, Tarver. Alana's sitting in this great sunbeam. It's like cutting right. I know that's magical. Yeah. 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 I don't, I'm not sure if this is great, but it was not planned, I promise. Right. <laughs> it's a wonderful effect, though. Yes. Oh. Hi, Zigzag. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully, we'll have one. Yeah, right. Oh, my God, Zigzag. I love you. you guys. If you haven't read Zigzags, the Brothers Jet Stream, it's one of my favorite books. Oh, awesome! It's really, really great. It's like it's very, very cross genre, and it's mm -hmm. it's like if Cowboy Bebop and Prince and and oh, Steampunk had I'm like a love child. Hi, Tova. So, anyway, Tova's one of my oldest friends in the world. Yay, oh, Tova! Tova. World. Very excited Hi. she's here. Mm -hmm. So, where are people joining us? <laughs> if you want to put in the comments where I you're, didn't plan uh, where the light, I on. swear. What, what, so great. what? what is a good dramatic effect? Always accept an unexpected dramatic effect. Matt, what were you saying? I said, where are people joining us from? They could write in the comments. We could see like who's the furthest away. <laughs> well, Linda's in Arizona. I know. That. I was going to say Linda might win this one. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. The Carol, the clock is um, from Mere Woods. It's, uh, oh. yeah, it's Hi, from Ken. Redwood. Hi, Ken. Here comes Jack. Come on, Jack. Come on. Make an appearance and he'll put you from in Arizona. Come here, Jack. Here comes Jack. Well, All right. Jack. Now I have my opportunity. <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There he is, a special banner just for Jack. Oh just for Jack. He's doing, he's going to be doing a reading tonight. It's real short. <laughs> he wants to pet him and up. Oh, he's lying down. Okay. Yes, my baby boy. Yeah. Oh, he wants me to pet him and then he's going to bite. <laughs> Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Ooh, we got a Washington Brooklyn, State. Brooklyn, Detroit, Brooklyn. Hi, Sebastian. Brooklyn, New Salem. Jersey. Yeah. It's beautiful New Jersey. Uh, Salem, Mass. Oh, yeah. Detroit. Oh, nice. oh, I didn't know Clarence said you were from Detroit. Washington State. Nice. Hi, Gordon. Weehawken. Salem, Massachusetts. Yeah. Jack again. Jack, look at the people. Can you see? Look, no, you want me to. <laughs> look, Jack. <laughs> Jack, look, 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 what's that? No, he doesn't care. He's looking at my lap. If you want, you can steal in it. Come on, the rest of my lap. So what are you guys going to be reading from tonight? 
Rhode Island. Um, I just had the final novel in my trilogy come out, um, The Poet King. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'll be reading from. And I'll be reading the epilogue of A Sanctuary of Spirits, which came out in November mm -hmm. and leads directly into the prologue of A, Sun a Summoning of Souls, which nice. I don't have a full, you're going to have to do it this way. So I, th there's my cover for book three. It's adorable. What is that? Hang on. There there go. Go. It's just a card I made. Oh, that's very nice. All right. Oh, you made so, that? That's beautiful. That's an epic cover. It's an yeah. epic cover. Lou Malkanji yeah. at Kensington did these gorgeous esoteric covers for my Spectral City series. Beautiful. And so I love that all three together, they're just magical and they really evoke the esoteric nature of what I'm doing. So, um, so yeah, so I'll be going right from this, right into this um, uh, little action creepy stuff. And then I realized it when I was picking my selection that I needed to read a little bit into chapter one. So I at least meet my main character. <laughs> Let, let's just meet her. So anyway. I'm really excited to read this. Yay. Hey boy. I yeah. like the sound of esoteric. Oh, oh yes. Thank you. Well, and I love your, as I have said online, I love your prose. So I'm so excited for this culmination of this series. If you have not read it, everybody get on this trilogy. Oh, I think Harel wins the competition. He's from Israel. Oh, nice. oh you definitely win. That's incredible. Oh, wow. Awesome. <laughs> uh, 25 live viewers right now. Good. It's two in the morning in Israel. Oh my gosh. Oh, you a good boy. That's amazing. Well, thank you for staying up, unless you <laughs> Or for waking I mean, I'm up. pretty nocturnal, so, you know, I I appreciate this. Uh, I told my parents not to do it, because um, oh, yes. they're in Israel as well. Thanks, like, Teal. Well, it yeah. will be on YouTube forever, so they could watch it tomorrow morning. There we go. Exactly. I yeah. just didn't think they should get up at 2 in the morning. <laughs> what are you doing, Jack? Make up your mind. <clears throat> okay, no. All right, I don't care. Either yes or no. All right, what do you want? Oh, thank you, Amy. That means so much coming from you. That's so cool. Yay, yes. Uh. Oh, my friend Rachel is coming on soon. She's in Israel Yay. too. Oh my gosh. That's so nice. Thanks That's everybody. A deal. Thank you, Rel. That's nice. I think that's, is, it, is that our favorite <laughs> listener ever? Diana. Oh, oh my gosh. Hi. You know, I'm thinking about, I mean, this is just thinking out loud, Ellen, like maybe when we get back into the bar, I don't know when, whenever that will be, that maybe we could set up some kind of live broadcast. It'd be great. That. How would we do it? How could you, you could just put that? a little phone on a tripod and, and, um, it would be great. I mean, it's, been YouTube. it's been really cool. Yeah. That'd be great. It won't be it's like really as cute. fancy as this with uh, banners and Ooh. titles and you know uh, Brady Bunch squares, but uh, it it it'll be it'll allow people to be part of the the show. Yes, I to respond to some of the comments. I absolutely feel pretty confident there are some ghosts watching too. Absolutely. I mean, I you know. They're kind yeah, of that, unfortunately YouTube is not counting them, so that's yeah. part of my marketing plan, really. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see, Jack is now lunging at me to bite. He's done. He's, all, <laughs> he's, he's done. Twitching and off. Jack the jerk. I mean, he's he got to live up. He has a whole chiron. He's got to live up to it. Yeah, he was hate right. right now. Why are you hating me? Why are you looking like that? That's what you love. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a shithead. He's not that bad. I met him for the first time, even though I've been there many well, he times. Like you. He came out last time I was there, finally. Oh, did he? Yeah. I don't trust him. He's twitching his tail. I can't trust him. He's looking at me. What? What do you want? These broadcasts give me life. Well, I'm glad, Zigzag. <laughs> Giving all of us life right now. Oh, when, when we go back, when we go back to 
what I know. The main thing is live. You have to get zigzag in to be a reader because he's awesome. It's 710. Let's do this. Do we want to start? Yeah, if you want, sure. Okay. I will introduce Alana first. Okay. So, uh, ready? Hi there. This is Ellen Datlow at Fantastic Fiction at KGB, and I co-host this with Matt Kressel, and we do this usually at KGB Bar um, in the East Village every the third Wednesday of every month. But since the coronavirus has hit us, we've been doing it live um, on YouTube for the last, uh, this is the third month in a row. And so I am happy to invite everyone here and to hang out and we'll have questions um, afterwards. You can comment where you see, I, I mean, I don't know what it looks like. I'm not looking at the YouTube one because I'll get confused. I'm looking at the private channel, but you can comment on YouTube. And okay, over the next few months, we have scheduled June 17th, N.K. Jemison and Kenneth Schneier, July 15th, Mike Allen and Benjamin Rosenbaum, August 19th, Michael Liebling, and we don't know who else yet, CK. September 16th, Craig Gidney and Livia Llewellyn. October 21st, Laird Barron and someone else, possibly. <laughs> and November 18th, um, Kat Rambo, and we haven't scheduled farther than that right now. So anyway, um, we have a good lineup for the next few months, and you know we have no idea how long we'll be doing this on online, uh, but hopefully we'll be live eventually it, at the bar. And by the way, the bar really needs help. Usually, you know, I don't know what they're doing without you know they have no customers. They I doubt if they're open at all, and they really could use funding. So um, we have a banner here to support the KG Bar during the shutdown by donating if you can. Donate the price of what you would be paying for a drink, and that would be make them very happy. And they give the bartenders a, perf, a, a, a portion of that payment. Now, anyway, our first reader tonight is Alana C. Meyer, who has worked as a journalist in Jerusalem and a cultural critic for various publications. She has written book reviews and critical essays for the Globe and Mail, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Salon, and the Huffington Post. Last Song Before Night was her first novel, followed by Fire Dance and The Poet King. So please welcome Alana C. Meyer. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you all virtually. I did not plan to be sitting um, in sunshine. It's a little weird for me. I hope it's okay for you. Uh, <laughs> I just just this past March, uh, during the pandemic, um, the final novel in my trilogy came out. It's called The Poet King. Um, this trilogy um, about poets and dark magic has been um, a 15 year journey for me. At least I think it's been 15 years, who's counting? Um, and it's very exciting to have reached the ending um, each of the books is, in its way, a self-contained story. Um, at this point, by the third book, uh, the conflicts have become bigger and in some ways deeper than ever before. Um, and I'm excited to share this piece with you. They stood on a hill gazing across to the castle. Its towers were sharp, pointed. It looked to have been carved from the stones of the cliff itself. Below crashed the waves, surrounding were the green hills of the west. Dorn wondered what people here had thought to awake one day to this castle appearing above them. He wondered other things too, like how his friends were faring without him, how they'd felt to find him gone. What are you thinking? Etherell, sounding playful, that you made a fool of yourself last night. It wasn't what he'd been thinking, but why miss an opportunity to insult him? In any case, Etherell had spent the last night drinking and dancing like a fool, even dancing with the queen, leaning close to her as if she were some village girl. He'd invited Dorne to join their dance as well, 
like he'd forgotten his own treachery. Dorn had turned himself around deliberately to watch the stars instead and drink alone. I know you're sore with me, said Etherell. Look, all you have to do is steal this, whatever it is, for the queen, and she won't kill you. And meanwhile, you get to see what's inside that enchanted castle. I'd go myself if it didn't have to be you. That's easy to say, said Dorn. For all your, your professed eagerness for adventure, you seem very attached to your own neck. Going along with one conqueror, then another, you seek power, that's all. That's all? Etherell was studying his nails. What else is there? Anyway, we should keep on if we're to be there before sundown. Those were her orders. I should make you drag me the whole way. What do I care? You want me to carry you, perhaps? Etherell sounded sarcastic. Look, there's no time for a tussle in the grass, and I'm sorry for that. It would do you good. Dorn spat at him. Go to hell. Etherell put his hands on his hips. I don't think you understand. She'll kill you if you fail. She'll kill me too if I fail to get you there, but never mind that. Wouldn't that be a stupid reason to die because you're angry with me? She'll kill you too? Dorn sneered at him. Really? Do you promise? Probably, Etherell shrugged. Make my head explode, twist my limbs off one by one, leaving the head for last. One thing I can say for our queen, she's creative and she gets her way. Dorn found himself moving forward down the hill. He felt too tired to fight, though he didn't want the other man to see that. But it was true, he didn't want to die. Ahead, the cliff rose higher, a wall above the sea. It cast a shadow all across the downs. I suppose you know why I have to wear these absurd clothes. That morning, folded in his tent, was a suit of green and gold brocade, emblazoned on his chest in gold, the symbol he'd come to know too well, the double spiral. There was also a sword, though that was next to useless. He wouldn't know what to do with it. And then there was the gold harp, gold strung, standing alongside. He'd half expected it to vanish at his touch, it was so fine. That would he be his disguise, a wandering poet, a disguise that was also truth. I don't know why you'd complain, said Etherell. You look remarkably well. I feel like a trimmed goose marching to the feast. No, this the other man said with sudden seriousness. You're not a sacrifice. This is a mission, a quest, if you will. And she has given you her word that she will only kill you if you fail. You take her word? I do. Lies come of weakness, if you think about it, Etherell said. He sounded as if this were a thought he worked out as he spoke. In a true position of power, there's nothing to conceal. Interesting, given that you've been lying all your life. Exactly. Etherell smiled at him. Look, we're here. This is where you go on alone. They were a short distance from the cliff face. The sky was stained red with the setting sun. So was the sea. Dorn turned in his tracks. He had to put aside his rage and hurt just now. Other things mattered more. Etherelli said, if I fail, yes, please don't let her kill Julian. I know if you want to, you can protect her. You have more power than you think. Etherell was looking up thoughtfully at the sky. He said at last, I'll do what I can. I like the girl. Swear it. Etherell gave a laugh at this. I don't make promises, he said. Not ones I mean to keep. I'd rather not lie to you after everything. So that's the best I'll get from you, said Dorn. Well, he turned away, began to walk through the grass to the cliff face. His face was stiff and stinging with fear or something more. Fear made sense right now. The abode of the Shadow King was just ahead. He might kill you, the White Queen had said when instructing him last night. But I think not. He loves poets' songs almost as much as I. The cliff face was smooth, apparently unmarked, but he knew what to look for. When the sun is just above the horizon, the light will catch upon it her voice in his head again. Soon he found it, engraved lines flashing back the remainder of the sun. A small carved symbol, the double spiral within a circle. 
It was about the size of his palm. Dorn touched his hand to it, fingers spread. He heard a rumbling, quickly stepped back. A creak of stone against stone, then a door was opening. He looked back. Ethrel was gone. That stung, too, that he had not even thought to see him off. It's time to get used to pain, he told himself, and to strangeness. Go on. He stepped inside. The door swung shut behind him, a creak and a click. He turned instinctively, but there was no sign of the door from this side. He pushed experimentally and nothing, no way back. A spiral stair led upward. He set his feet on the first step and rehearsed in his mind what he'd been told to say. When he arrived at the top of the stair, a man was waiting for him. He wore the livery of a servant. You're expected, he said. Come this way. Dorn hefted the harp as he went. Follow the servant down a corridor where here and there were various doors all shut. At last they came to a hall with a great fireplace. The room was huge and bedecked with holly. Near the fire sat two people. As Dorn approached, he saw that it was a man and a woman. The man was reading from a book propped on a desk. The woman, young and ravishing in red velvet, was seated on the carpet with the dogs, two hounds with coats like bronze. She threw a holly branch for them to fetch. They both looked up. The man was entirely unprepossessing, a face and figure Dorn would have been hard pressed to recall of perhaps middle age. He was neither tall nor short, neither large nor thin. His neat beard were made Dorn think of a banker. Good morrow, he said courteously. His accent was perhaps a touch unfamiliar. We don't often have visitors. He looked Dorn full in the eye. Here was one thing that caught Dorn's attention. The man's eyes, green, gold-flecked, hard to read. Dorn came forward. He'd been instructed what to say. I'm a poet. Come to entertain your majesty this New Year's Day. How did you enter here? The lore of poets is nearly lost, but not forgotten. The man stood, by some trick of the light seemed taller. And do you know me? At this door and bowed. You are the king who is new to this land, yet older than its mountains, he said. You are the one who hunts prey even to the ends of the earth and brings it down. From the hearth rug, the woman clapped her hands. A gesture unsettlingly like the white queen, but this woman did not arouse fear. She was not of a great height nor luminous. Only her hair shone, alternately like gold thread and honey in the firelight. Something new, my lord, she said. Let's have this poet to sing in the new year. The gray-bearded man issued a small bow in her direction. Very well, my lady, he said. I know how you love your entertainments. So, Dorn Aaron, it seems you can stay. Dorn hadn't told this man his name. He stood staring a moment. But the other man was already sitting at the desk again, the book tipped up before him. It was leather bound in black with gilt embossing, yet there was no title on the cover or spine. Without looking up, the king waved a hand. Go, get settled in your chambers. Supper will be served shortly and then you'll sing. Supper was a ludicrous affair from Dorn's point of view. He hadn't seen such a spread in all his life. The long table was covered in its entirety with dishes of gold and silver. The aromas recalled to him that he hadn't eaten properly in days. Given his situation, it was difficult to summon an appetite. At one end of the table sat the king, though Dorn had trouble thinking of him as such. He'd expected the so-called Shadow King, opponent of the White Queen, to be more imposing. At the other end sat his lady. Dorn had never learned her name. Either of their names, come to that. The holly branches decorating the hall recalled to Dorn his ostensible reason for being here. The feast of New Year's Eve was in two days. On the third day, dawn of the new year, if he had not fulfilled his mission, the White Queen had promised Doran would perish on the spot, wherever he happened to be. She had laid this enchantment upon him, her hands first to his forehead, then his lip, her lips, and then, of course, had smiled. She'd given him no guidance about what she wanted. It was a keepsake, she said, 
something she needed back. The implication being that the Shadow King had stolen it, though Dorn was not sure he believed that. If that were the case, she could have just said so straight out. Instead, she hedged and would only say that it could take several forms, and Dorn would have to be aware enough to recognize it when he saw it. His life hinged upon this, to identify what she wanted and steal it for her. It seemed impossible. He probably didn't have long, so why not face that and take what he could? So he thought as the servant seated him at the exact center of the table between the Shadow King and his lady. He tried every dish, every ale and wine, all of it excellent, even better than it smelled. His last days would be sweet ones, he suddenly decided. As last meals went, these would do. As he ate, the couple engaged in polite conversation. The king planned to go hunting on the morrow. She reminded him that it would rain at midday, so he should go early. They didn't seem to notice the stranger at their table until the end. It was only when they'd all eaten their fill that the king asked Dorne to sing. As Dorne rose and took up the harp, he had a thought that almost made him laugh. He had dreamed of performing before kings. Now here he was. The White Queen hadn't advised him what to play, so Dorne followed his instincts. He sang of the turn of the year, green turned to snow, the chariot of Thalion circling the earth. It was a tradition, this song, and seemed appropriate for this hall. When he was finished, there was a silence. Dorne kept his eyes down, not daring to look at either the Shadow King or his lady. At last the lady spoke. I am satisfied, my love, she said. Are you? It is pleasing enough, said the king. It's settled then. The Pope will stay with us until the new year as our honored guest. Then it was time for dessert, as if there had not been enough to eat already. The servants brought out cakes of almond and honey, a cherry pie, a strawberry sorbet that the lady remarked was a fashion of the East. By the time they were done, Dorn thought he'd never eat again. Surprisingly, he did not feel ill from the indulgence, just mildly stirred by wine. Thoughts of death seemed to worry for another time. His chambers were another ludicrous indulgence. Dorn had marveled at them before and now did so again, especially when he saw that the enormous bed had been turned down for the night and a scented bath drawn. He wanted to collapse into bed, but it seemed a shame to waste a bath. He doffed his green clothes and luxuriated in the warm water for a time. He emerged smelling of lavender and collapsed into the soft bed. Its coverlet was cloth of gold. That night was the most restful he'd had and longer than he could remember. He didn't dream. He was startled awake the next morning. Someone was sitting at the foot of his bed. It took a moment for his eyes to come into focus after the wine he'd drunk the night before. Another moment, and he saw it was the lady. She was smiling and positioned in such a way as to accentuate her breasts, which her low-cut dress displayed to effect. Dorn became aware quite suddenly that he was naked under the coverlet. He drew it farther up to his chin. You slept a good while, she said. Aside from being cut low at the neckline, her gown was splendid, silver and gold, fitted to her like a second skin. Her hair was pulled up in a net and sparkled with gems. Dorn wondered if he'd ever seen a woman so beautiful and doubted it. The terrifying white queen hardly counted. I was tired, he said, aware of the absurdity of the situation. He spoke casually, as if he were not petrified. He could only guess what would happen to him if the Lord were to discover her here. It was, it is kind of you to visit and wish me a good morning. You could return my kindness by any means you like, she said. My husband is out hunting. Right, he said. If you turn your back, I'll dress and sing for you. Would you like that? She appraised him. What if I don't turn? I really would prefer you did. She laughed. You are a strange one, Dorn Aaron. I'd heard tell that poets have lusty appetites and a way with the ladies. I'm sorry to disappoint you, he said, really, but I will sing myself hoarse for your pleasure. She pouted, then turned her back. It was bare, white as alabaster, with a single dewdrop diamond from her necklace dangling at the nape. He could imagine how most men would feel and react in this situation. 
He drew the coverlet about himself when he stood, not trusting her, then retreated behind a screen to dress himself. A new set of clothes had been provided, these crimson lined with ermine. He was astonished to find they fit him perfectly. When he came out from behind the screen, he jumped. A different woman sat there now. This with coils of black hair that reached her waist, scarlet lips and dark eyes where before they had been blue, but the dress and necklace were the same. Perhaps now, she said, this time in a voice that was lower, more throaty. She lifted a bare shoulder. I know men have their preferences. For a moment, he could do nothing but stammer. You are lovely, he said at last, but how would it repay my Lord's hospitality if I took liberties with his wife? She laughed, low and musical. He'll never know. But I would. He grasped for the first thought that came to mind. It's a matter of honor. She sighed. Suit yourself then. Sing for me. Then come to breakfast. The breakfast was lavish. There seemed jam from every fruit for him to try, as well as fresh fruits. On a silver dish was served a honeycomb. The lady insisted he eat in a teasing manner. She spooned various kinds of jam for him to taste, urged him, leaning close, to lick the spoon. He kept up a polite manner as best he could. Earlier in his chambers, he had sung for her a ballad of a king on the hunt. He hoped it would send a clear message, but afterward at breakfast, she seemed by no means deterred. Meanwhile, he had to recall that there was a more pressing matter to be concerned with than the virtue of the Shadow King's wife. There was the matter of his own impending demise. So while he deflected her flirtation, he was careful to be courteous. He needed her goodwill. She might be an ally, given her willingness to betray the king. When she urged him to tell of himself, he saw an opening. I wander throughout Avar collecting tales, he said. I hoped in these enchanted halls to find marvels to recount. So far there is my lady's unearthly beauty not to mention your ability to change shape. A marvel I will sing of, to be sure. She laughed. That is nothing. I get bored and change all the time. She was currently back to being honey-haired, having changed at some point in their climb down the stairwell. Dorn had not seen it happen. Perhaps it was between one shaft of sunlight and the next. To you, it's nothing, he said. To me, a wonder of the world. But so far, this castle seems a bit ordinary. I'd have thought a king of the lands beyond would have a palace full of marvelous things. You mean enchanted objects, perhaps, she said, leaning forward over the table. The diamond necklace sparkled between her breasts. Yes, he said, exactly that. She smiled. Come with me. She took his hand. He thought better of protesting and followed, hoping it was not some trick. She led him to a door of carved mahogany with a finish like glass. She looked back at him over her shoulder and set a finger to her lips. We must be quiet here, she said, or the servants will get us into trouble, especially you. That got his pulse going. He followed after her. She closed the door behind them and locked it. He surveyed the room. It looked like a library. The walls were lined with leather-bound books. Dorn tried to read the titles, but the letters shifted and blurred before his eyes. Sunlight streamed from tall windows that looked out on a garden. The trees seemed to give the lie to its being winter, their boughs loaded with cherry blossoms, swaying slow and serene in a breeze. There was no way a garden like that existed atop a wind-torn cliff, not in any season of the year. Doran turned his attention to the room. Everywhere were objects on display, how to single out one or another. He saw swords mounted on the wall. Nearby, a hand mirror turned face down on a table. Its back looked carved of ivory. When Doran picked it up, instead of seeing his reflection, he found himself looking into another room where a man with his back to him was rummaging through some papers. Doran put the mirror down hastily. There were other things an hourglass filled with what looked like powdered gems in place of sand, a great gold globe encircled with rings, engraved in silver with the constellations, a crystal sphere mounted in brass that changed color depending on where one was standing, and from one angle seemed filled with smoke. 
In one instance, he turned and suppressed a yelp, but the warrior he'd spotted in the corner turned out to be an empty suit of armor. It was tremendous, taller and broader than a man had any right to be. The plates so black they seemed to absorb the light. The helmet was huge with the antlers of a heart. Clasped in one gauntlet was an axe handle, thick as a young tree with a massive blade. Dorn stepped aside in case the axe should fall. What an idiotic manner of death that would be. But who fit into this suit of armor? Was it for show? The lady watched him but said nothing to guide him or explain. At last he asked, what did you want me to see? She looked mischievous. Oh, do you know what would happen if we were found in here? Down below, there are no dungeons. My lord doesn't care for those. Instead, he has a trapdoor that opens to the ocean. Isn't that marvelously clever? You should have heard the screams of the last people he had thrown down there. You sound oddly calm at the idea of being drowned, he said testily. It would just be you, she said with a sweet smile. Now then, you wanted to know what is in here. As you can see, this room is filled with fascinating things. But there is one thing, ah, yes. She had a wooden box in her hands suddenly, though Dorn didn't see where he should gotten it. Look. Within nestled an amulet on a chain. The pendant took the shape of a sphere and was paper thin, hammered cold, and engraved at its center. Dorn's heart sped up again. Perhaps I thought of this because of the symbol on your clothing when you arrived, she said. It's the same, isn't it? Dorn stared at the double spiral engraved in the amulet. It's the same. He darted a glare at her. Is this trick? You want this? She lifted the amulet by its chain to the light. It is lovely. In that moment, he found himself making a decision, not knowing what else to do. He met her gaze. My life depends on it, he said. That's it. <laughs> Hi there. Hi there. We were muted, but we were all clapping. That was great. Oh, was thank great. you. It worked. Thanks. Oh. Thank you. So much. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Doesn't it? Uh, anyway, we're going to take a break. Um, you can buy Alana's book various places, I'm sure. Yes. Online. Inside, various <laughs> places. Uh, uh, last yeah. song before my um, first book. Yeah. And Ken, I'm sorry I pronounced your name wrong. Apparently, it's Schneer. 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 Yeah, Schneer. But anyway, I'll get it right next month. Schneer, yeah. But anyway, um, so we're going to take a break, five minutes, bathroom break, drink break, anything you want. And we'll be back with Liana very soon. All right. Bye.
Okay, we're just waiting for Ellen to come back. Hope you guys were able to refill your drinks. Um, so uh, basically everything uh, in New York City is shut down right now. If you're not in New York, and you probably know this already, um, including the KGB bar. The KGB bar is um, an esteemed literary institution in New York City. New York Times rated it as one of the best literary venues in, in New York City. Um, it's a great bar. Um, it's, it's like an amazing dive bar. I mean, I, I say that in the most loving way. Um, uh, it's got like Soviet era kitsch on the wall, which actually like actual real Soviet stuff. Like it's not like replicas, it's actual stuff. In fact, uh, they had, um, stuff that was valuable and stolen. So now they, I think they have copies up on the wall, but uh, it started off as a, as Ukrainian speakeasy during the McCarthy era and then became, um, you know, a New York literary institution. So uh, they've been closed, everything's closed here. So uh, we really wanna keep them in business because not only do they host the fantastic fiction series, but they host um, a lot of other literary events uh, every month. Um, yeah, almost every weekday. Of the almost weekend. every weekday and weekends. Um, so, you know, I've participated and uh, been, a, uh, you know, an attendee at, uh, other series as well, and they're all interesting and different, and you know, cater to a different section of the oh, poet communities, etc. Uh, so you see that link at the bottom of the screen there. If you go there, you can donate to their fundly, and they were hoping to get you know three hundred thousand or something, and I think they've only they've gotten less than five thousand. So even if you're just sending them a few bucks, the cost of a, a drink, you know, you're going to go to the bar and get a beer or a soda, you can send them five, 10 bucks. Yes, and you can help if you can, you know? Um, yeah. So Ellen, uh, Ellen did, did most of our spiel. Um, so for, for those who Sign up. Uh, signing up. Yeah. So I was going to say, all right, so we, uh, we have a website. It's at kgbfantasticfiction.org. Let me see if I have a banner up here. I don't know if I, yeah, here it is. Um, KGBfantasticfiction.org. And you can go there and sign up for a mailing list and you get like uh, two or three emails a month just to remind you of like upcoming readers. Uh, we really don't do anything beyond that uh, with, with the list. Um, so this series itself, if this, if this is your first time tuning in, Fantastic Fiction at KGB is... KGB comes from the KGB bar, uh, is a monthly speculative fiction reading series that we hold on the third Wednesday of every month um, at the KGB bar. Um, Terry Bisson and Alice Turner, uh, the late Alice Turner, started the series uh, in the late 90s. Uh, they were attempting to bring together mainstream writers with writers of speculative fiction in order to show in Alice Turner's words that at a certain level they were plowing exactly the same field. Um, since then, it's become mostly primarily speculative fiction, that is science fiction, fantasy, horror, and all the overlapping genres therein. Um, in the spring of 2000, Ellen Datlow took over for Alice Turner. In August 2002, Gavin J. Grant, uh, publisher of Small Beer Press, stepped in for Terry Bisson when he moved to California. And Matthew Kressel, that's me, stepped in for Gavin in April of 2008 when they just didn't want to make the commute down from uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty long for them. Yeah, so, so like I said, we hope you could support the bar uh, during, the, um, during the downturn to keep, keep them going and um, during the uh, pandemic um, quarantine. And uh, all right, so our, our next reader, and let me just get my banners ready here because I got a lot of them flashing on the screen here. Our next reader is going to be Liana Renee Heber. And let me just get your bio up here. Here we go. Liana Renee Heber is an actress, playwright, and award-winning best-selling author of gothic gas lamp fantasy novels for Tor and Kensington, such as The Strangely Beautiful, Magic Most Foul, The Turnophiles, and Spectral City series. Her work has been included in numerous notable anthologies and translated into many languages. 
a ghost tour guide for Manhattan's boroughs of the dead. She's been featured in film and television on shows like Mysteries at the Museum. Her website is lianareneheber.com. And here is Liana. Hello, friends. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. I wish I could be with you in person, but I'm thrilled to be with you here uh, virtually. So what I'm going to be doing is reading from a little bit of Sanctuary of Spirits. This is book two in my Spectral City series. Book one is The Spectral City. And then book two is The Sanctuary of Spirits. And then book three is up for pre-order now, and that is A Summoning of Souls with these beautiful esoteric covers, thanks to Lou Malkanji at um, Kensington for these. What I'm gonna do is just read a little bit of the epilogue of Sanctuary of Spirits, and that's gonna go right into the prologue of Summoning of Souls. It's gonna be out July 21st from Kensington. It is available for pre-order in digital as well as trade paperback wherever books are sold. I'll be doing a pre-order campaign for signed copies of Summoning of Souls via Word in Brooklyn because I definitely wanna support a local independent bookstore and all of us in New York know that Word is really great for uh, both in community outreach as well as uh, supporting local authors. So um, all you need to know going into this Within the Spectral City trilogy, each one of the books solves a different mystery. So by the time we get to book three, we're solving the overarching mystery, sort of the big bad who's been kind of in the background of all of this. So you're gonna meet the big bad at the end of, um, at the end here of Sanctuary Spirits, and that's gonna carry us into the prologue. So really all you need to know is that this is a novel full of ghosts. It's a paranormal procedural focusing on the ghost precinct, which is a group of young female psychic detectives who work along with uh, a fantastic uh, hero, a very uh, handsome detective named Detective Horowitz. And so he's sort of the ally for the girls in the department and he helps as sort of a, li a departmental liaison and they stick up for each other um, because they both all face different discrimination, Jacob Horowitz, being Jewish and of course the women being women. They have a lot uh, that they're trying to sort of fight to take, uh, to be taken seriously in 1899 Manhattan in their respective fields. So um, they make a wonderful partnership. So they're in the midst of trying to solve a particular set of crimes and they do so with the help of their favorite friendly ghosts. So some of which you will meet in these following chapters. So it's 1899 Manhattan. from the epilogue of A Sanctuary of Spirits. Albert Prenz walked calmly through a thin gap in the hedgerows towards the back of his mansion, letting himself in a rear entrance he'd had blocked off since before he'd gone to England and everything changed. He wasn't worried about the girl. He could handle her, but she was going to prove a fight. But in the end, she'd serve his purpose. If she couldn't put up a fight, it would mean she didn't have enough power for what he needed. He'd finally be rid of that which he so reviled. He descended the damp stone stairs to the cellar level, turned down a narrow passageway, and turned a key in the lock of an unmarked, previously unused storeroom door. A dim overhead light revealed a host of grayscale floating spirits, all of whom whirled around at the sound of the door opening, the wraiths in fine gowns and suit coats cowering at the presence who stepped in and shut the iron door behind him. During an extended bout of knocking out his brother and preoccupying his sister, he'd had this room's walls fitted entirely with metal plates and installed one of his devices, the buzz of a constant Low voltage electrical current made the surfaces of the walls occasionally spark and pop. A tall, luminous, statuesque spirit, all mist and gray scale, dressed in a grand gown of the mid-century, was pressing her transparent hands against the iron-clad walls of this prison, yelping in pain and confusion at the resultant shock. The sound delighted Prenz. He'd finally done it. 
captured and held the one thing he wanted most, the tables of who terrorized whom would finally turn. Out of the nine trapped spirits, she was the last to turn at the presence on the threshold. The woman's usually fearsome expression transformed into abject horror. At this, Pren smiled. Hello, mother. End of book two. Prologue of A Summoning of Souls. Manhattan, 1899. Margaret Haythorne wafted along Fifth Avenue in her favorite ball gown, forever sporting the opulent fashion of the 80s. Her skirts doubled with a fine bustle decked in bows and gathers, her dark hair pinned up with a few cascading ringlets. To the living eye, the young woman was transparent and all in grayscale, but Maggie's favorite dress had been a bright rose as pretty as she'd once been praised to be. Glancing down at her rustling skirts and undulating pattern hovering over the cobblestones, to her eye, the rose was faded, but it still held a whisper of blushing color, a little slip of life. At present, the wraith was on an important mission. Looking in the front windows of opulent mansions, Maggie startled the occasional child who looked out from them. The act, if she were honest with herself, gave her a distinct delight. It wasn't that Maggie wanted to be a terror, but she had to take her pleasures where she could. And Maggie had always liked to be seen, whether in an admittedly shallow life or now as a more mature ghost. For some, becoming a ghost wasn't a choice, but for Maggie, she retained every bit of agency she wanted. No, she couldn't pick things up or feel touch and embraces like she used to, but one adapted. At any point she wished, she could say goodbye to her loved ones, corporeal or non, and leave for that sweet summer land the spiritualists spoke of, eternal rest in some wonderful Elysian field. Someday, but not yet, there was very much work to do. Death had rearranged Margaret Haythorne's priorities, having been caught up in all manner of terrible things she'd unwittingly unleashed. She was murdered nearly two decades prior. Having sacrificed herself to save others, the act absolved her of torments caused by her ignorance. Her spirit lived on to make sure that Eve Whitby, the daughter of those she gave her life for, had a ghostly auntie always watching over her. It was Maggie and Eve's mutual mission to help make New York that much safer and brighter, instilling a spectral purpose she'd never had as a snobbish socialite. The spirit paused before the target address. Every time Maggie tried to return to this terrible house, her spectral form quailed as if the wisp of her that remained could not bear to confront this place of trauma again. The Prenn's mansion, patriarchs of tonics and dubious cure-alls, the Prenn's twins had made a fortune off chronic pain and symptoms of disease the medical profession had yet to cure. One twin, Albert Prenn's, had died in an industrial accident at one of their London warehouses, or so it had been said. Albert was, in fact, alive, operating under a false name and acting from the shadows. Even his twin brother, Alfred, didn't know he was alive. None of these details would be important to Maggie had Albert Prenz not made two things very clear. He was intent on destroying any ghost he could, no matter if they wished to haunt on and help mortals or not. And he was sure Eve Whitby and her ghost precinct of the New York Police Department was an obstacle in his aim. Well, the man wasn't wrong. They were obstacles. And living and dead, they were about to fight back. Maggie just didn't know how. Thus, her research expedition. Floating into the Prenn's hedgerows, she waited. The thick manicured branches around her made her feel safer, as if she were in the brambles surrounding an evil fairy tale castle. Again, Maggie tried to remember what exactly happened the night she disappeared. When Albert Prenn's had tried to break what remained of her soul in two, never to haunt again. She'd been drawn to mention by the spirit of children who wanted her help. For whatever reason, she'd been able to get in that night, but never since. She remembered the electric lights had been odd, perhaps a malfunction in what she now knew was an electrical blockade, snapping at spirits like a switch to keep them from coming in or out. When she had gone inside, she did as the two siblings had asked, and she managed to muster a small burst of physical force to send a collection of post-mortem photography flying. In doing so, she'd roused the attention of their present nemesis. 
He had sent his house guests out of the room, turned to her with a cruel sneer, and flipped a switch that tore her out of existence. As if swatting Maggie from this memory, a ghostly, wrinkled hand slapped against the glass of the thin basement window. Maggie startled, almost tumbling out of the hedge. Help us, came a desperate elderly voice trying to travel the distance to her spectral ear. He wants to kill us all, end us forever. We'll do everything we can, Maggie murmured back, unsure if she could be heard. The sharp whinny of a horse as a driver cracked a whip was like an extension of the faint scream she heard coming from that cellar room. Looking behind her, she wanted to get the attention of the living. Do you hear that? Can anyone help them? But she couldn't. So much was happening in New York City. So many people in their own little worlds. And here in the finest part of town, where everyone's little world was opulent and more important, it was clear that anything that happened in anyone else's the ghosts were alone for all they knew with no one but themselves to care. Take care, we'll find you, hold fast, Maggie said, doubting she could be heard from the hedgerows, but she had to say it. She had been abandoned before in life by society's finest, and it was the worst of betrayals because they, of all people, could have afforded to help her. Maggie was startled by a presence appearing beside her, a dark-haired little girl in a white dress singed at the hem, who immediately began exclaiming in a thick Polish accent, they're trapped, I have to show them a way out. The ghost of Zofia Berezowska was about to float towards the window when Maggie grabbed her and held her close. The 10-year-old ghost that had died at work in a garment district fire had devoted her spectral life to helping the living out of myriad dangers, pointing the way out when smoke cleared or pushing something over to sound an alarm or summon help, fearless in rushing to the rescue. Sophia, love, not here. Maggie clutched the young ghost she thought of as a little sister, even tighter, her voice breaking. Not here, you can't. Don't you know this place is dangerous? This is the Prenz mansion, the place I thought killed me again. The first time she'd been murdered was quite enough, and she didn't like the prospect of dying a second time. Then why are you here? Zofia threaded her fingers through Maggie's. I came looking for you. After losing you, don't you think I might look after you better than before? They floated together, weightless, but connected. It had taken Maggie time to get used to how much touch was different in death. An embrace was half as full as the fortitude of life. Of course, neither she nor Zofia could touch the living at all beyond the caress of a cold breeze. So the ability for a spirit to have solid contact with another spirit was one of the comforts of this existence. Maggie tried very hard to appreciate her existence as one of floating, subtle, muted nuance. As it registered to her senses, death was full of gentle touch and quiet whispers. Death was soft and delicate. The girls stared at the imposing mansion before them, the hands at the window, imploring, pointing. That's more than I can bear, Zofia said. And that's why I'm back, Maggie countered. I don't know how we're going to prove the evil of this house in ways that the living can prosecute, but this is now our sole focus. What if we could compel someone living to go in for us? Zofia asked. Someone who isn't Eve or any of a precinct operatives, seeing as they're now known by the family. That could work, Maggie said, her mind already whirring. She'd taken note of several sensitives in the city, not those as gifted as ran the ghost precinct she worked for, but ones who did see or sense. We might find an ally I hadn't thought to utilize. Good thinking, little one. Sophia looked up at Maggie proudly, and for a moment in those wide, dark irises of the child's eyes, Maggie saw the reflection of the fire that had signaled her doom. Even ghosts were haunted. The choice was theirs if they would let it entirely define them or motivate them to a new mission. There was movement in the basement. A form loomed in a dim doorway before darkness overtook the cellar again. The ghostly palms withdrew from the barred windows, but the sounds of sobs overtook the exterior garden. A murderer of ghosts, living like a king in the finest part of Manhattan. The ghost precinct has to root him out, Zofia murmured. Force him into the light. I already have an idea, 
Tell the girls I'm off on an experiment and not to worry if I'm not back for a bit. Let's see if I can scare up some help. And just a page of chapter one. Chapter one, Eve Whitby came to in a forest glade with no memory of how she'd gotten there. Before her was a stone cairn, and from its foundation rose a single sandstone Gothic arch, the only standing evidence of a chapel that had never been built. Eve recognized this sacred place, having been called here before to commune with the spirit world. This was a place that spirits called sanctuary. She must have sleepwalked to this precipice between worlds. Again, the sky was brightening, dawn had broken on a cool late autumn morning as the last months of the 19th century were shortening. The realization of where she had wandered came with a wave of terrors. Where were her colleagues and were they all right? As director of the ghost precinct, she was responsible for three young women, gifted psychic mediums. As leader, she was setting a poor precedent of wandering off unannounced, a rule she'd made her team promise they'd never break. The last thing she remembered was trying to get to sleep after Albert Prenz, a man with no morals, a vehement hatred of ghosts, a terrifying capacity to mesmerize and compel his subjects, and a likely culprit of murder, had drawn her and dear Detective Horowitz outside into a confrontation, threatening them before disappearing. She and Jacob Horowitz had parted ways after a breathless private moment together, and her heart burned with a flame it had never before experienced, while her mind raced with terrors of the present case. The combination of yearning and fear hadn't made for a pleasant night's sleep in her grandmother's fine townhouse, but being so restless, she should have remembered rising, throwing a house coat and wool coat over her nightdress, and getting on a northbound train to exit outside the city limits on the Hudson River line, but she didn't. Thank you. Very good. That was great. So a few people commented on your on your theater background, right? That was great. Yep, it's 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 a really handy training to have. And I considering I couldn't decide whether I was going to become a professional actress or professional novelist, I have remained both. And so yeah, I, yeah. I do both. That's great. And it, it's been a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, yeah, the, um, both readings were uh, amazing. Um, and Thank you. Uh, so one of the, the, the fun things about doing the live stream is that we can um, open it up to questions from the audience. I mean, we could do this in person too, but we, we never did it in person really. I don't know why, I just, I mean, sometimes we do like a, a trivia or a raffle or something and we ask questions, but um, usually uh, we don't do it like this, but, um, so uh, being that, uh, Liana, you just finished, um, can I ask uh, why, why do you write about the Gilded Age? It's a time period for me that has been a bit of a, I can only really explain the draw, which goes back to when I was about seven years old, obsessed with the late 19th century. I can really only liken that to a past life experience, something that I was, some energy that carried into this life in this soul. And the Gilded Age in Manhattan, in New York City, in the five boroughs, it's its such an incredible time period to write about because so much was happening. And I find that because I love to write stories where different people from different backgrounds are coming together to save the day, there's no better wonderful place than, that, than, than where that was happening in real time is Manhattan and in New York City immigrants from around the world and different cultures, different faiths were coming together and trying to make it work. And also too, new technologies were allowing for new people to join the workforce across different class lines and across different backgrounds, racial lines, faith lines. So the idea of having women in the police department was not a new thing. There were police matrons um, from 1880 onwards. Now, granted, their mission was very specific, but this allows me a little bit of play because spiritualism was such a huge um, uh, fascination in the 19th century and a way that was 
forwarding women's rights because women were thought to be sort of spiritual authorities in many different spiritualist circles that were um, emergent in the late 19th century. It gives me a great place to play with all these different people from different backgrounds and different identities, again, coming together and finding out a way to sort of be kind of adjacent to, uh, you know, appropriate high-end society, but also finding their own way through it. So it was a, a time of class mobility and cross-class communication. Um, and so for my for my characters, it's a dynamic time period. Plus you have this idea that you have electric lights, that the new the new technologies of electricity, and my my characters are trying to deal with the modern advent of the telephone and they hate it but yet they're getting in the carriage. And so it's this wonderful mix of modern and antiquated. And that for me is just such a rich time period. So, and a lot of our modern civil rights movements, they all have their base in this time period. So I can write about, you know, progressive uh, interfaith alliances and interracial alliances in the late 19th century. And it's not anachronistic, it was absolutely happening. It's mm -hmm. a great answer. Um, I want to, um ask Alana uh, a couple questions. So um, your your book, The Poet King, is the, is the final book in a trilogy. Yes. Um, how did, first of all, how does that feel to have uh, finished that? And, uh, and what are you working on next? <laughs> uh, of course, it feels amazing to have completed a work that I started in 2004. <laughs> so, you know, it's been a really long journey to get here. And it's, um, and so, of course, that's a great feeling. Um, during the break, um, my husband got me um, all the books in the series because he thought I should show them to the audience. So, this yeah, is the first book. Yes, they're so beautiful. Life. I know I'm, I'm very lucky. Tours covers were amazing. The artist is Stefan Martinier. Um, this is the second book. Uh, with the asteroid. I love, I love that cover. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great feeling. As for what I'm working on now, you know, like I, you know, since I'm in front of an audience, I'm not going to give you the cranky answer that I give to friends who ask, but, you know, I <laughs> working on something new is, you know, it comes with a lot of, um, difficulties and I'm just you know in the weeds with it and I'm not quite sure where I'm going and just reminding myself that the previous books tortured me just as much so mm -hmm. I should you know maybe be a little patient but I really you know there are never any guarantees sure. um, so I just uh, don't know what to say right now because like I don't know what's gonna happen with this thing but I'm working on something <laughs> Um, and I can't wait to say more in a year from now. <laughs> yeah, we're all excited. Um, so, um, like I said, we're going to open it up to questions. So, if you guys have questions out there, you're watching now, type, type it into the, um, the live chat. Um, there is a little bit of a delay. So, if it takes us a second to see your question, uh, please be patient. Um, but... Um, yeah, I mean, what a what a wonderful pair of readings tonight. I, I knew you guys would would go well together. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just like I had a, a sense that there would be a lot of synergy. Uh, totally. Yeah, synergy there. I was so, very excited to 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 see how you paired us. I was I was thrilled. We try yeah, to make it, that people up. You're always yeah, good about that. <laughs> it's not always super easy because of schedules and things like that. And of but, course, uh, people coming outside the city. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yeah, we'll have to see what's going on with the, uh, the quarantine going forward. But, um, yeah. I mean, in, in a certain way, it's actually easier to attend if you don't have to travel, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, it's it's pretty thrilling to see friends from all over the country who are able to join us. So, um, yeah, so, yeah I, I love the idea of trying to see how we can go forward with the best of both worlds, both in person and with this live element. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like, um, you know, I know when Jim Freund does his radio programs, he does the live stream uh, on face on Facebook. So maybe we could do something like that, but on YouTube. Uh, okay, Harold asks asks this question: Are you both up for a mystic ghost crossover between the two books? 
I absolutely wow. think that that beautiful castle is totally haunted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <gasps> so cool. uh, here, <clears throat> what would be great about that would be like the whole unreliable narrator scenario of is this a is this an actual haunting or is it just an illusion from the powers that be? Interesting. So, do you guys ever slip in references to other writers' works or other writers, like little sly references to people you know or works that you like? Well, I think the very end of, of my epilogue of, of Sanctuary of Spirits with the Hello Mother, it's pretty clear what that's a shout out to. Oh, like, right, right. you know, especially for, because my work is very gothic in its tone, I'm absolutely doing a little wink and a nod and a grin at traditional Gothic literature, but trying to kind of like poke at the tropes to make sure it's not continuing certain harmful marginalizations that a lot of Gothic literature originally was actually trying to kind of point out, but how do you do that for a modern era? So I definitely, you know, um, I am definitely a product of my current climate, but I'm also a product of all that great Gothic literature um, that was trying to kind of ruffle feathers in a good way of its day. But those tropes do need to be re-examined to make sure that they're not inadvertently continuing, um, you know, sort of a status quo that's not, that that was, is going to feel really out of touch. There's a question. Is it from Zigzag? Yeah, so Zigzag Claiborne asks both of you, uh, even though your books are markedly different, did both of you consciously go into the stories intent on having and projecting fun? Uh, <laughs> what a great question. Ilana, you want to take it first? That? Well, if I didn't enjoy what I do, I would not be doing it. I would be doing something that earned a living. So yeah, I absolutely do um go into it with the intent to have as much fun as i can <laughs> and of course i hope other people will enjoy it once it's in their hands i i definitely too had a moment i had a really before i started working on the first spectral city book i had a real hard slump after um finishing the strangely beautiful uh quartet finishing that last book in the strangely beautiful saga i had a really difficult time with it and i basically just sort of turned to my characters um, in the Spectral City series and said, I need you to make me love this again. And because I'm such a character driven novelist, um, I really just kind of leaned on them and they came through. Um, you know, they, the characters for me are so vibrant and so in my head and I, and I hope that reads and that thankfully it's been one of the things that people comment on is that they, that, is is the character driven nature of what I do in the atmosphere. So I think it was like I I had to sort of turn to to this book and be like, okay, I need to get some kind of magic back. So it was really trying to get the fun back for me. Right. Here's another question. By the way, hi Didi from Yeah, Israel. so yes, obviously not just the country. Yes, we are global. So okay. thank you for our Israel friends. Do either of you have real life ghostly anecdotes you'd like to share from Nancy Lambert? <laughs> oh, I have tons. How much time <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. So yeah, right. I'm opening I'll, to Leanna. I'll, I'll quickly share my very favorite one. And this is a shout out to uh, Sebastian because he's in uh, Salem. And this is my Salem ghost story. So I was in the Hawthorne Hotel, which was built in the 1920s. And it I was awoken out of a dead sleep at three in the morning, which people think the witching hour is midnight. No, it's three in the morning. That's the time of most ghostly activity. And I was awoken from a dead sleep. And I've been, you know, dealing with ghosts and telling ghost stories and working as a ghost tour guide for years and years and years. I'm not necessarily scared of ghosts. It's it, there. If I were, I'm in the wrong business. Um, so I, I noticed this very interesting sound. It was a tinkling of keys. Very distinct. You know, we all know the jingling of a, of a, of a ring of keys, but it was going up and down the hallway. And and just sort of like pacing up and down the hallway. So in as I'm kind of coming to from a deep sleep and trying to take in this sound, I start to kind of think about what I'm hearing and it sounds far away, almost like it's through glass. And then I realize that the jingling keys that are going back and forth down the hallway as I am at the end of the hall in room 606 or whatever that's worth, um, as the sound is sort of pacing, I'm thinking, you know, I should be hearing footsteps with this sound, but I am not. That's interesting. 
And then it occurs to me, wait, the Hawthorne Hotel is a key card entry hotel now. No one would have their keys out to be getting into the rooms. Oh, well, what could this be? And of course, as a ghost tour guide, I'm thinking, well, maybe it is the spirit of a service person um, who was here cleaning these rooms and this was their regular route. And it's just a bit of sense memory. And I'm hearing this Claire audience haunting. And as I'm putting this together, thinking, well, the only thing that I can make sense out of this sound is that it is the keys of, of a work person. Uh, this jingling sound is coming closer. And then there's a pause. And then the next sound I hear is a fingernail scratch three inches above my head on the wooden headboard. Like I said, I, I, I pride myself on not being scared of ghosts, but this was a little close for comfort. And so in this moment, and we all know, again, just as distinct as that jingling of keys is that distinct sound of a human fingernail on wood. That's a very distinct sound. It was unmistakable. And so I'm thinking I have to do something. So I, I sort of think, well, what do I say as a as a ghost tour guide? I always say that ghosts want to be acknowledged, right? A lot of times they're ghosts who may have, you know, feel like they didn't get enough credit in life. Okay, so I blurt out to the room, thank you for all of your hard work through the years. The room is beautiful. I really appreciate you. And then there's a beat and then jingle, jingle, jingle down the hallway and I don't hear the sound again. So always acknowledge your, your uh, resident ghosts uh, wherever you are. Uh, essential it, worker. It, it, yes. <laughs> okay, Alana, do you have an example? Do you have a real ghost story? Like that? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sebastian. You should. I should. You should. You know better with me. Sebastian. You know Sebastian has a question here. This is a sort of big, vague one, but what were the original inspirations for these two series? What tropes did you really want to explore or what images first came to you and excited you, et cetera? Alana, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, I started Last Song Before Night when I was still in my early 20s in college. Um, little did I know it would take me 10 years to write. <laughs> um, <laughs> And at the time, I was really wrestling with the idea that, you know, I so was, felt so compelled to become a writer, to write books. Um, but I was also very aware that I had a responsibility to support myself, you know, to exist. Um, and so I was really just struggling with this idea of, like, what compels me to do this thing that is so pointless, really, in terms of, like, my existence? You know, I, I really do think I could have made money doing something else. Um, and so... You know, at this very at the same time, I was taking a course in Celtic literature, and we were um, studying some stories about the Celtic poets and how um, they had in in these myths they had political and magical power in their societies. Um, and I was thinking, wow, a world where poets have power, which obviously is not this one. Um, this, you know, is really you know a, f a fascinating vehicle through which I can perhaps explore what art means to me. Uh, and so I drawing on myths of Celtic poets, I put that together with um, the troubadours. And those were the foundational inspirations for Last Song Before Night. Um, as the series progressed, I added in other elements, including uh, Middle Eastern mythology. Um, Leanne, it's your turn. That's great. That's so great. I love hearing other people's processes and why they're driven to do to just, you know, embark on these journeys. For me, it was really all of my books have a strong ghostly element in them. Um, all of my books feature ghosts really heavily. But one of the things I hadn't done uh, in a series yet was sort of the idea of a paranormal procedural. And I really wanted to engage in that. And the idea of having these friendly ghosts uh, helping the living allowed me to then also really let ghosts be seen in a different light. So, so often when we talk about ghost stories, they're really honestly there to scare you. And Eve's sort of whole point with the ghost precinct is she wants people to think of ghosts as a help, not a horror. So I wanted to kind of turn the ghost story angle on its head a little bit and be like, what if we've just got a bunch of, of very dear friendly ghosts? And then by that, I can tell 
some of New York history. Um, any of you know the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire? Sure. Well, that wasn't until 1911. I was if you were really that's really ahead. Really exactly. So when I mentioned Little Zofia, um, the Polish immigrant spirit who had died in the fire, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire was, you know, a culmination of years of protests and other fires and other deaths. And, and this sort of like last straw of things that have been happening for years and years and years. So the ghost and the way that they have died allowed me to deal with different injustices mm -hmm. and also to allow them to kind of look out for others who are living, who need help. This is why my my cadre of women are, are drawn from all corners who come together and it's the ghosts that bring them together, whether right. it's the ghosts that, um, that that compel uh, my my trans woman uh, Antonia. She joins the precinct because the spirits tell her this is a safe place to go and be. My little orphan Jenny, one of the other mediums, um, is drawn there because the ghosts of her parents who die say, "Here's a place you can go, and if as long as you can participate in a séance, you'll have a job." Right. Um, and the same thing with. Cora Dupree, my, my Creole woman from New Orleans who comes up to work there. They're very driven by mission. And so those are the themes that really, for me, kept me going on this. And uh, and and it's one of my favorite series I've written, so. Cool. Uh, Another question, anybody? Uh, Amy Goldschlager wants to know, how do you tip a ghost? <laughs> Well, I really like I really like the uh, the point that uh, who who said burn money in an envelope. See, there you go. You you answered your own question. So you've got ghost money. Isn't that a Japanese? Right, there we go. Chinese tradition. Right, ghost they do paper ghost. money though. Usually. They have ghost money. Right. But is it China? Like special currency, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I think I think for a lot of uh, again, I think for a lot of ghosts that I, in my experience, the ones that just want to be acknowledged, the acknowledgement is what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, now, if it's if it's something really negative and you've got a lot of poltergeists, that is out of my. You're gonna want to see a professional about that. That's that's beyond my pay grade. If that happened to me, I really don't know what I would do. I mean, I. I you know I love horror fiction, but I really never want to actually experience a ghost. You gotta move, like you gotta move. You gotta move, like <laughs> the people that live in in 14 West Hunt Street. That's the most haunted house in New York, and it's really problematic. Like no, no, if you just have to move, you can't be in that building. I have no interest in meeting a ghost or hearing a ghost or experience a ghost. In oh, any it can be really fun though. Mm, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. It's really fun, <laughs> Crazy cats are enough. Who's caused problems? <laughs> right. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Get them in now while you can. You guys have any questions for each other? Yeah, do you have questions for each other? Alana? Liana? Um, okay. I can't, Alana and Liana, I didn't even realize. I, yeah, well, now I'm really motivated to check out Liana's books, and then I'm sure I will have questions. Yeah. I think I um I want to um I want to by my in in reading all of this I was like I wanted a, like a separate supplemental book of all of the poetry and all of the songs that they're singing so I would love like a follow up of like oh and here's the like I would love uh is is there like a soundtrack of particular ballads or balladeers or like classic, you know, troubadour kind of thing that it was in your mind when you were writing? What I did was um, I read a lot of poetry. I, I made a, I actually, when I was writing Fire Dance, I made myself, didn't make myself, I made a rule for myself to read a, one poem a day in the morning um, as a way, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking of it as kind of like steeping myself in that because there is not a lot of poetry in the books, but I wanted to sort of infuse the books with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I have readers come over to me and they're like, there isn't a lot of poetry in the book, is there? Because you know, they just don't want to. I'm like, don't worry, don't worry. There's like very little. <laughs> I, I think of it more as like a sensibility that permeates the book. I love it. <laughs> uh, someone asked, how are you all holding up in quarantine? Ugh. I'm planning in advance. I mean, I'm I'm at the point where I'm planning for things that I hope will happen. Like I, because I missed, because I'm missing Con Zealand. I still have, I have a ticket. I will have a ticket from Qantas I have to use by 
sometime in 2021, although if things are really bad, I assume they'll extend that. But I'm thinking of going to a convention, uh, the NatCon in Canberra, Australia, which will mm. be the fall of 2021. Hopefully by then we will be, oh. we will not, you know, so I'm planning that. And if I do that, I'll be going on a road trip to Tasmania afterwards. I've been to Tasmania oh. once. And I'm actually, I was talking to a friend, I really want to go to a goddamn casino. <laughs> I mean, that's, I like going to casinos. I'm a, I'm a, as I said, I'm a cheap slot, <laughs> penny slots I do, but I enjoy them. And I go with my, I, when I go to visit my mom, we go to the casino. I'm not going to visit my mom now. I haven't, I mean, I don't know when she's in Florida. Um, but a friend of mine who went to Atlantic City right before this all happened, I'll never go back to Atlantic City because the bus coming back were like horrible. I mean, it was two hours late and it's like I was standing in the cold and I said, fuck this. But I'd go to one of the ones in Connecticut, like Mohegan Sun or, or um, F uh, Foxwoods overnight. And we were talking about that. He was like, I don't know how they're going to ever fix places like that. I mean, they're filthy. You know, I mean, I'll bring my own hand sanitizer and every time I touch something, I'll clean it off. But that's what I would like to do. So I'm actually thinking of the future that I want, you know, um, it's not a question of optimism. I mean, I am optimistic when I'm going to survive, but I'm terrified of, in the meantime, you know, I go out to my to supermarkets, but I will, I will not go out without a mask, of course. And um, it's really kind of weird, but I'm, it's kind of, not that different from my normal life in some ways because I work from home. I mean, I think a lot of us work from home. Um, I miss going out and seeing my friends in person. I've been meeting one friend who comes in who, who's not in town anymore. I mean, she's staying outside of town for the, for the, during this whole thing. But she's coming in once a week to pick up mail. And so we met at the, in a pocket park nearby and sit two benches away and hang out. And that's really, really nice to see a human being who I know in person. Yeah, so that's getting, and you know, not being able to go to theater, cinema, dinners with people. So how about you guys? I've just been trying to work on writing projects, honestly, just try to, to focus on getting several different projects, you know, in different stages of drafting, um, in different stages of proposals and things like that. So I've honestly been just trying to keep busy. Um, I've been really busy making uh, jewelry. Um, I have an Etsy shop. Uh, if you go onto Etsy and you look for the shop Torch and Arrow, Torch and Arrow is my Etsy shop. Uh, that's been helping keep me afloat because a lot of my work as a performer sure. and as a tour guide, you can imagine that's wow. been tricky. So I've had to shift a lot of stuff online and I have been doing some virtual tours, but there's something about you know if you're not actually in front of the building a picture is just not quite the same thing as being in front of something so that's tricky but thankfully the company i companies i work with and some of the libraries i work with as a guest speaker have been able to try to shift things online so i've just been trying to keep as busy as i can with as many different types of art as i'm i can do in all of this and that's been really helpful right alana how about you uh I, not much about my life has visibly changed um, since this started, except like we don't go to shop, right? Um, but we were supposed to go, we had like all these plans. Uh, we were gonna be in New Orleans for a month, um, you know, cons, oh, whatever. Well, oh, I like, like missing four cons, at least just four. Raised, so like, there's, there's no longer like anticipation of anything. That's why like, I think Ellen, what you're doing is really smart, like planning in advance, like so that you have something to look forward to. Um, just yeah, with all even, the even if it's just a dream, do it. Even if it's like two years away, I think it could help, help. Yeah. Like yeah. I, you know, we just don't know. Obviously you understand this. We don't know what's going to be. So it's just been like, you know, so we, you know, we, we rebooked a place that we really like in New Orleans for next year. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, honestly, I don't know what's going to be. Um, right. right. I'm thinking more like maybe we'll try to go somewhere where it's just nature and not be around anybody. I have a feeling is what everyone's going to do. <laughs> now, I like nature um, in very small doses. I could not stay in nature more than two days. I'm not talking about camping. God, no. Right? Just like, oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that when you go... When you go to New Orleans, you got to yes. take a ghost tour because they have the best ghost tours. I've done that. I love, I, I okay. like the ghost 
for a lot. We, we, I'll tell you what we once did. We stayed in the um, hotel Bourbon Orleans and we did the ghost tour of their hotel because that um, yeah. It's from the 1800s and haunted, and it was really cool. It was a very yeah. Cool I knew exactly place. the building. I love that city. Yes, I, I I can I do too. I think we have common interests. <laughs> totally, totally. And, and aesthetic tastes. Yeah, uh, Matt, absolutely. What have you been up to, Matt? Uh, well, you know, I work from home, uh, and I, you know, so the actual schedule of my day didn't change all that much. I mean, my my wife. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an occupational therapist. So she uses the computer for a chunk of the day. So I had to shift some of my stuff a little bit later, but like, I'm kind of doing what Leanna does in that I'm like doing a lot more art. In this case, I like taught myself 3D software and I've been doing like wow. 3D renders. Oh yeah, cool. that. Trying to do some of like science fiction visions that I have. Um, it turns out that, that like my ability to imagine something and my ability to create in the software, there's a huge gap there. So I'm working my way towards like the stuff that, uh, mm -hmm. that I envision, but, uh, that keeps me busy. And, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we haven't been going physically shopping that much, but we, we were able to get some, some food delivery. Um, it's still really surreal going outside and everyone's wearing masks and they kind of, you know, look at you and you walk past the street. Someone's not wearing a mask out across the street. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. people like sit on their own stoop or something and they're not wearing masks. And I, I guess I kind of get that because it's like they're just going, I don't know. But um, yeah, like we've been we've been trying to uh, go running uh, not as often as, as we should. But, uh, well, me more than my wife. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, I'm I'm waiting for it for it to lift. I mean, the, there's some promising signs that you know the curve's going down. There's some promising uh, drug studies that are that are you know in the works. So um, I'm just trying to be patient and just trying to focus on work. I'm actually almost done with uh, a novel. So actually, I am done, and I'm just polishing. That's awesome. Yeah, I have yeah, a actually a friend gave me really good advice. To he's like, I'm like, no, I think it might be too long he's like well why don't you split it into two books oh, maybe there you go. actually a really good idea yeah. Um, wow yeah i find yeah. i'm really busy um but I'm, it's hard for, well it's, it's always hard for me to focus because i'm always pulled by twitter and facebook <laughs> and the news well, that's like the perennial <laughs> problem i think it's no different than in the last three and a half years <laughs> that part yeah i'm watching i'm starting i've been starting to watch i started to watch amazon prime free things on my computer i've never watched movies on my computer before um and it's okay i mean i like it except it means i'm getting less exercise even than i was <laughs> in a way at least i would move to my bed to watch my dvds which i still <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone was asking, someone asked, have you discovered anything surprised you about yourself because of quarantine? Oh, For I me, missed that. Oh, here we I go. I really like my own exactly. company. <laughs> I mean, I guess I always knew I've always liked my own company. I have no problem being alone. Um, well, what, what is fun, though, what I'm discovering is um, I can video chat with all my friends around the world and see them more than I ever see them because, you know, I only see them maybe once every three years at a convention, some of them. So I've been, you know, doing that with people from Australia and England, and it's great fun, you know. So that's something I never thought would – I mean, I don't know if that's going to last outside of the quarantine, but I really like it, you know. But you have to schedule it. You can't. I can't schedule more than, like, one or two the most a day. So I feel sorry for the people who have to Zoom meetings all the time because I'm sure they're totally exhausted. I know they are. That's for me what 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 was the hardest thing to discover. I mean, I I I am a performer, but I am still an introvert. Um, so just because I'm a performer doesn't mean that you know I'm not a, still an introvert. And I think um, one of the things, and and I've I've heard some people online talk about how surprised they were about how draining doing the online stuff is for an audience where you can't feed off of their energy coming back to you, and just how 
exhausting it is to be putting a whole lot of stuff out when yeah. you're on stage or when you're on a panel or when you're at a convention and you have other people whose energies you can bounce off of. It's like, I'm, I'm trying to kind of shift my brain so that I'm envisioning my friends who are here in this chat who I know, you know, and try to feel them that way because it is a very, it's tiring in a way that you is, is was surprising to me. Yeah. 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 I would not want to have to be zoom meetings all day for people. No, no. I mean, meetings no. in person are bad enough. I mean, luckily I've never been in a job where I had meetings all day. I mean, I know a lot of people do, um, I mean, physical meetings and like uh, doing them online is probably even worse than being in person. I mean, to do them like five a day or something, if you have that many meetings, that kind of thing on Zoom. I'm wondering that I'm missing like like um, stuff that I wouldn't think I would miss particularly. Like I just miss just walking to the gym and going to the gym, like not even at the gym, just my walks to the gym because it, it was usually after I'm done with work for the day and then I'd go and I'd clear my head. Maybe I'd make a phone call. Usually I listen to like, a podcast or an audio book. And it was just like that moment. And I could still go for a walk and do that, but it was just the whole um, routine of it is, is. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to do, I mean, I'm walk, trying to go outside every day for at least two, first it was just to walk around my block. And actually in the last few days I walked further. I walked to the river on Sunday. And it wasn't crowded. It wasn't bad at all. I was able to walk along the Hudson in my neighborhood and sit, find places to sit where there weren't people, but not too yeah. it was great. I didn't, I mean, of course, well, we are, are really lucky now because it's spring. I mean, it's lucky we can go out and hang out. I mean, alone, whatever, if, you, if it's not too crowded. I don't know what it's gonna be like by summer, mm -hmm. but right now in my neighborhood, it isn't packed and that's good. Yeah. I've been trying to go in a different direction every day and walk around more, a little bit more. Has yeah. anyone noticed how blue the sky has been? Like it's in New York City, the sky doesn't get this blue. And, and, yes, and it does. Sometimes you know, in, in the fall, it does. But in, it what's that? On 9 11, it was very blue. It was blue. Very, very blue. The fall. Really? I don't remember that. Well, the problem with New York is spring only lasts three days. It's winter, it's spring for three days, and then it's summer. So summer's going to be here any second. So enjoy yeah. the weather now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, where I am, it's going to be chilly for a while, but it's always short. Hmm. Oh yeah, Amy, I can. Yeah, I just want to see other people's faces and not be nervous about it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Here it is. Didi is saying my significant other is teaching on Zoom and finds it way better than she expected, but the key is getting the students involved. Yeah, I guess if they're not, it must be deadly. Is it talking to like? Chanuk Chanak asks, "What's the sky?" Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, sky. I know the feeling. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, it's beautiful here. The weather. Yeah, it's it's been oh, beautiful. The, sky, the Gibson line. Um. The, oh yeah, the sky was yeah, a. The, the color of the sky. Wait, the color of the sky was a TV, TV with was Dead Channel. But but it used to be gray, right? Because the Dead Channel was yeah, gray right, Hispanic, and now it's blue. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some people have said that it's really hard for them to watch movies and things with their crowds. I'm not having a problem with that. You know, I mean, seeing a movie with people in crowds who the make your parents, how could they be in crowds like that? There's too many people there. Um, but just seeing real people on pictures where they're not maintaining social distance, that freaks me out. Well, it may, I, I just get very aware of it. So we're watching Better Call Saul and there's like a scene and they're in a restaurant. I'm like, wait, they're not social distancing. <laughs> like, like it's just in the back of my head. I'm like, oh my God, we can't do that right now. People keep touching their faces, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever feel comfortable going on very there. conscious of it. <sighs> uh, so any more questions from the audience before we wrap it up? Yeah. Uh, I'll wait another minute because there's a few seconds delay on the. If we missed any. Uh, in, in there. If we missed any. But, um, what's that? I'm what's just going to also see if we missed any. Yeah. Um, I don't but, think. So. Uh, do you guys have any close closing closing thoughts? Um, 
Summoning of Souls is up for pre-order wherever books are sold. So um, Sanctuary of Spirits is out. Um, Summoning of Souls is up for pre-order. Um, I will be doing a signed pre-order campaign with Word in Brooklyn, um, but that campaign, the, that order page isn't up yet. But as soon as that's up, I'll be shouting that to the rooftop through all my social medias. So um, yeah, I'm of all social media, I'm most active on Twitter at Leanna Renee. So my first and my middle name. Um, and, uh, and I just wanna thank folks for literally tuning in from around the world um, at, at, at quite, extensive hours uh, late yes. into the night yes. uh, yeah. Israel, thank you, um, for being it's a part of this because it will it'll be online that they can come in here and, mm -hmm. you know. and I, I really appreciate that and I love that this is something folks can access after the fact I really appreciate that so just thanks for everybody for coming out Ellen and Matt as always you're the best um, Alana I love your work and so I'm thrilled to be here so thank you yeah, it's great thank having you. you guys thank you, thank you. okay you it just really warms my heart to see all these familiar names and to know that people in Israel stay up till almost four in the morning. I can't believe it. <laughs> Thank you for you people in Israel. Yeah, That's I mean, so it's just, uh, you know, I love reading in the KGB bar. It's like this, you know, experience that I've never had anywhere else. But this is something that has its own beauties as well that I would not have expected where we can pull in people from all over, from all time zones. That's very cool. Yeah, I'm really grateful that you guys showed up. Yes. All yeah. right. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, thank, thank you both for uh, great you reading. Both. And thank, thank, you for our thank you, everybody, for coming. This for is watching. Um, 4 a.m. in Israel. Yeah. We hope everybody is staying healthy and, and safe. Calm. And, um, you know, we're hoping sure that, that we'll be able to see you in person. You know, if you do feel depressed, you can... Think of, if you're not video chatting with your friends, consider it, that it really does help. And just reach out. You can do it. There's so many forms. Zoom, FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, and Skype are four of them um, that are usually usually easy to use if, if everyone can get on the same thing. Sometimes it's like, oh, my God, I can't get on this for some reason. But, you know, but anyway, if it's only two people, it's easy. If you're trying to organize four or five people and you can't get on the system, forget it. <laughs> but anyway, it's like, oh God, no. <laughs> it's uh, like, I can't get in right now. I can't. No. But anyway, um, yeah. So consider that if you find yourself being lonely. You know? Yeah. And uh, all right. Month. With, yes, with that, we will see you next month. So bye, everyone. Probably here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming probably out. Here. Yes, thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. All right. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.